see what the lag is looking like. There's always a lag between me hitting record and LinkedIn and YouTube picking up. Please work today. Please be in my favor. All right, YouTube, you see me. Come on, LinkedIn. I know you see me. Any day now. Okay. All right. All right. Awesome, we are live. Hey y'all, how's it going? Um, it's Adriel here for anyone that is new here um, and has not met me. I don't even know how to introduce myself at this point because I'm going through a whole transitional phase. So sometimes I introduce myself and I am a diversity, equity, and inclusion thought partner. Sometimes I introduce myself as a consultant. I've been moving a little bit away from thought partner, but realize that language still is pretty fitting. Um, for folks that are new to, I guess, my LinkedIn community, it feels weird to call it that, but it's starting to feel like a community, which I appreciate. Um, I've been doing this work for some time. Um, I really focus on helping teams and leaders think about how to create more inclusive workplace cultures. Um, so even if you don't want to call a DEI at the end of the day, my goal is always to help people come together to leverage all of their incredible talents, experiences, backgrounds to achieve common shared goals. That's the most uh, succinct way that I can put, put it. Um, I am a black woman. I, for those of you that may not be able to see me today, I'm wearing a nice Barbie pink shirt. Um, I have glasses on. I have my hair in mini twists, which are up in a bun. Um, and I'm joined today with my good friends and DEI conspirators. That sounds kind of wild, no. but y'all are some of my favorite folks, so it doesn't matter. That, right? I, like I know. It. I like it. It's to be arch. Um, right, exactly. But I, you know, I had this moment the other day, um, and I wanted to invite these two, and I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment to talk about this concept of code switching. It's something that I think um, all of us have experienced. And um, yeah, just recently I had an in-person meeting. I walked out of the meeting and important fact, I was the only black woman there, which no longer surprises me. But I walked out of this meeting and I physically just like felt my shoulders drop and I was like, okay, I made it. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> it's like pause. And I'm like, what is this? What is this feeling that I'm having? Um, and I had to check in with myself and I realized I was unconsciously code switching throughout that meeting. Um, and I'm asking myself, I'm like, you know, these are people that I, I felt comfortable in the room physically. I didn't have to my conscious knowledge. I felt comfortable. Um, I felt confident about what I was talking about. I've been doing this work plenty. I felt good about the direction of the meeting and what it might lead to, but I still felt this like relief, <laughs> this sigh of relief. Um, and it didn't help that shortly after I had a family member call and I'm like, hey, what's up? <laughs> and I'm like, this is not how I would sp have spoken in that meeting. It was just completely different. Um, it happened in a, a, a matter of moments that I was switching between what almost feels like two versions of myself. So I'll pause there. We'll dive deeper. But I want to give Karen and Clarissa a moment to introduce themselves. All right, Karen, you go first. <laughs> Um, well, my name is Karen Young. I am the founder and president of The Professional Adult. And kind of like Adriel, I am in a transitional phase. So I would normally say at this point, a DEI in management consultancy. However, a lot of my recent work has been management work, personal branding, and kind of operationalizing your workplace. That's where a lot of my work has been recently. So I'm not sure if a rebrand is fully in order or not, but we'll see. Um, I also uh, have started tackling and reintegrating some of my past life as a product manager and have been doing a little bit of the intersection between product AI and ethics, at what point does it make sense to use AI and not, and how we can use it as a way of looking at, again, uh, intersectionality and all of these other fun things. Um, that's my side project for Baldy Einstein. Um, but yeah, I, I'm i a girl who does a lot of stuff and I'm excited to be here. 
Fantastic. Um, so hello. Um, my name's Clarissa. I go by Clo. And uh, my pronouns are she and her. Uh, for those who are visually impaired, I am a black woman wearing glasses, curly hair, wearing a kofia. Uh, so I think all three of us are going through some period of transition, <laughs> uh, which is not actually uncommon in the DEI space at this time. I just want to add. But yeah, so um, I would typically introduce myself as a DEI practitioner, um, also a career and mindset coach, and I still do all those things. Um, and I am also um, helping out in the nonprofit space as well. So yeah, I don't know if a personal rebrand is in order right now, but um it's easy. It's part of easier to say that all three of us do a lot of things. We're always we're always on the move. So happy to be here. <laughs> so happy to have you both. Um, I feel like it's been a while since we've had one of these chats, and I'm always excited for them. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, let's get right into it. I think first and foremost, I think it's important as always to have shared language. Um, I, I see some folks here who may be new, so welcome to to the live feed of, of DEI and Five. Um, I'm gonna go to super basic actually to start before I even go into code switching. So DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. When we're talking about diversity, we're talking about our collective mix of differences. Notice I said our collective mixes uh, because an individual cannot be diverse. Diverse is used to describe our, again, a group's shared differences. Um, a lot of people think about that in, the, in terms of race um, or gender or ethnicity and often what we perceive, what we think we can look at or hear someone say and perceive about them. Um, but diversity can encompass so many other aspects or dimensions. It can be your religious beliefs, political beliefs. It could be uh, your physical stature. It could be ability, disability. It could be your familial status, languages you speak. The list goes on. Hopefully you're picking up what I'm putting down. That is diversity. Equity um, is essentially, uh, I always often say both a process and an outcome. So we're seeking uh, fairness. So uh, often conflate it with equality. And I wish I had my visuals ready right now. Um, but one of my favorite visuals uh, for this and kind of infographics is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They have this infographic where there's a group of four people on bikes. Um, these four people are of different heights and statures, and they are all given the same bike and expected to get from point A to B using that bike. Um, and there's even one person who uses a wheelchair for mobility in that illustration. And what we see happen is that person gets left behind. We see the person who is of a shorter stature can't even use the bike because it's too big for them. We see a really tall person who's cramped on this bike. Again, it's that standard one size fits all approach versus when we're talking about equity, we're looking at each individual and their needs. We're still providing them with the same thing, which is a bike, but I'm actually taking into consideration again, their needs. So the shorter person is given a smaller bike frame, the taller person, a larger bike frame, the person who uses the wheelchair for mobility, we're giving them a hand pedaled bike. Again, um, there is a very di significant difference between those two terms. So I want to make sure we're aligned. And then finally, inclusion, um, again, is both intentional action and an outcome, right? It's when we are taking into consideration that diverse mix of people, then ideally practicing some form of equity and there are equitable outcomes, hopefully. <laughs> and then the, the, the goal is that people actually feel included. Um, and so often inclusion is a qualitative measurement that can be combined mm -hmm. with quantitative things like demographics of folks. So those are our working definitions of DEI. Now code switching, what we're talking about today is really this idea um, of somehow adjusting who you are um, to kind of navigate environments where your own identity or identities, because we have many identities, um, or your own experiences are not the norm or aren't part of the majority. Um, the code or the code, the term code switching uh, originated really to talk about people moving between languages and dialects. Um, so it was coined back in the 50s um, and it was really something that was observed amongst bilingual uh, communities. And it was a way to kind of, again, just refer to how they were kind of switching between either those dialects or between, you know, English, Spanish, English, French, whatever it may be. Um, and so 
That has, of course, expanded. And I think most commonly, we often talk about code switching, I hear, and what I've observed as it relates to Black Americans. Um, and so often we talk about people switching between standard American English and what is often called African American vernacular English, AAVE, um, and how quickly people are, are able to kind of interchange between those two, depending on their settings. So just wanted to give those definitions and some historical context. Chloe, Karen, anything to add before we dive a little deeper? I mean, Maybe. I'm not actually hard pressed. You, you put a bow on that, actually. I tried. I'm... Yeah, I was like, two out of 10, no notes. That's no notes. I love it. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. Well, to start, what are some of y'all's earliest sort of memories of code switching and or what does code switching look like for you? So I'll share I'll share one because I want to also make make a point with it as well. So my first understanding and experience about code switching was not me code switching. It's about hearing my older brother code switch. So my oldest brother was in his 20s, 30s. And I remember like, I know my brother, I know how we talk at home, you know, and he, we always known that he loud, loud mouth, you know, we always use AAVE very frequently. I mean, it's home. But I remember him being on a phone call, talking to um, an insurance company. And the way his voice changed, like I've never heard my brother speak such proper, crisp, clean, and like it almost his voice kind of like raised a little oct uh, octave so it wasn't so deep, you know, it was a little less threatening um, talking to the folks on the end of the phone. And I'm listening and saying, you know, talking to the discussion. And then after he hangs up, Hey, Chloe, how you doing? You want to go outside and like hang out about just, just like that. Just, and I'm like, what, what, what is that? But yeah. that is a point that I wanted to make is that a lot of us learned it at home before we even really knew what code switching was like, like you, you pick up the voice changes mm -hmm. depending on the audience that my, like I would go to the restaurant with my father and you know, some people he would talk to a very different way when he's talking to a stranger and usually a white stranger that he doesn't quite know his voice, his language changes to more professional, less threatening, just like appeasing to comfort. So that's my earliest experiences is learning it from my brother and my parents realizing that they have been code switching. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say mine is similar that, yeah, it started at home, but I don't know if we even called it code switching. Um, You know, my, my parents are from the islands. I grew up in Houston, both places, both groups that are, are known for having, well, accents. But I remember being very young and hearing my parents say that they wanted my sisters and I to speak properly so that people didn't know that we were Caribbean or from Texas and that we could sound like we're from anywhere so that we could get a job anywhere. Mm. And, and, I, and I, I didn't have language for what that was exactly, but to know that the way that I heard the people speak around me just wasn't fully acceptable and that I needed to sound different if I wanted to get ahead. So again, I didn't, didn't know what exactly that was called, but yeah. I realized later on that that absolutely was code switching. Yeah, I think similarly, um, my my earliest memories were hearing my mom. Um, my mom has been an entrepreneur for a very long time and um, while concurrently working full time, <laughs> no surprise there. Um, but I remember like, you know, kind of sitting in and hearing her, you know, talk to clients early on in my life and how um, quickly, like you said, it was like in an instant, she could like be talking to me and tell me to do something. And then 
two seconds later, hello, this is, yeah. And I'm like, whoa, I'm like, what? Um, and I think there was also, um, there was also similar to you, Karen, you know, I was told like, you need to speak properly in th those settings. Um, it was never called code switching. I don't think anyone in my family or anyone that I knew even labeled it as that, or was aware of that term. Um, but very common. And I think, I, you know, growing up, I saw a lot of people do that. Even my grandparents, like who are um, very Southern folks, like I would, I would see them completely switch, you know, depending on who they were around. And so, yeah. And I, I think really important to note is that code switching, code switching, I cannot talk today, y'all apologies. Code switching is not just about changing how you speak. It can also be adjusting your mannerisms. Um, it can also be how you look, shifting your appearance, right? I, I wanna do a deep dive. We talked about this, Karen, about hair and how you know changing your hair, especially as a black woman, has a significant impact on how people interact with you and how they treat you. Um, and so it's not just speech, but it's beyond that. Um, I also find it very interesting. I don't know how familiar y'all are with the concept of double consciousness, but it's something that was first explored with W.E.B. Du Bois, um, The Souls of Black Folk. And it's just basically describing this double consciousness of black people where you feel like you have essentially split versions of yourself right yeah. your identity is is divided into multiple parts um and sometimes it causes a challenge where you may have identity crises where you're like who am i like if i am spending and i i had this a lot growing up because i grew up in a neighborhood where pretty much everyone looked like me it was a very um you know low to middle class black neighborhood um very working class some might call it blue collar um and then I ended up going to a PWI, predominantly white institution. Um, and I had to early on navigate those spaces. And I found very quickly, if I went into my school being myself that I was in my neighborhood, that I was at home, then sometimes people would make fun of it or they would mock it with a black scent, like, what up, Adriel? And I'm like, I don't like that. And I didn't know it. I mean, at that point, I didn't have any awareness yes. that I have now, right, about what that meant to have somebody mock you and use a black scent, right? I didn't know any of that, but I knew it felt wrong. It didn't feel right. I'm like, this is how I talk and you're trying to mock me. And so even that in itself just caused me to start shifting how I spoke and how I, I um, navigate spaces. Like, you know, even in professional spaces, I speak often and people have no idea where I'm from. It's like, yo, you're accentless. And then I talk to people outside of that in my normal voice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, you sound Southern in some way. I'm like, yes, yes. Cause I just naturally turn it off. Um, but there's a lot to be said, I think about the conscious and unconscious practices of code switching. Any thoughts on that? that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Oh, sorry. Go, go, <laughs> Jinx. I was like, yay. Um, yeah, I, and I think like Chloe, especially when you brought up the the idea of your your brother changing tonality, I think that that was that's one that really struck home for me. Like, I am actively trying not to speak in my professional tone, which is about an octave higher than how I normally sound. So when I talk to friends and family, I sound like this. But when I'm in a professional setting, I sound absolutely much higher, much friendlier, much more open. And it is, it is a designed thing that happened. And, and I, I learned how to do it my freshman year of high school. I went to the high school performing and visual arts my freshman year of high school. And I was told flat out that I would not be able to get voice over work because I did not sound the way that I looked and that I was way too young to be a 13, 14 year old girl with this voice. And so I mm. literally was trained how to sound more youthful or more feminine. And I think, again, the combination of that and the fact that I don't wear makeup unless I'm being paid to wear it. Um, I, I don't tend to wear um, hair. My hair is usually very, very short that there are then things that are ascribed to me and markers of perceived femininity, especially as a black woman that I don't get. And so I am treated differently because I don't ascribe to those same markers of femininity. And so 
I know that if I go into certain settings, I have to put on those markers. I will wear a wig. I will wear makeup. I will pitch up. I will do these things because I know that it is less stressful for me and less of a mental burden to adhere to the prescribed femininity than it is to just be myself completely. Yeah, I just want to quickly just comment on something that you mentioned that just grinds my gears so much is how black girls in particular are often forced to grow up so quickly and are treated by external people as adults so early on in life. It it really it grinds my gears to no you know, end. Adultification of black girls is just oh so God. weird. Like black girls and boys, but like from us in our space, understanding the lived experience. Yes. Of, it's, it's like I've all people would ask, like, it seems like you're so mature for your age. Like we, for some reason we had to, everyone made us that way. You've like, been here before. We had to be. Maybe been here before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've been here before. Like, yeah, we, I guess we had to, because y'all kept imagining us as six-year-olds as being 26. Exactly. Like, the markers they put on you is like, you know, this is how you need to be already. Like, the and for you, Karen, when, you know, talking about how the, the commentary about your voice, I got the same thing in college. So I went to a PWI, came from a predominantly Black city and neighborhood, went to a PWI in East Texas um, and <laughs> had, I took radio and television communications and we worked a lot about voice. And my instructor was like, that's great that you have a very clear voice. However, it's an octave too deep. Like when you're, when you have a feminine voice, you need to be a little bit upward like this. And that way everyone can all kind of visualize that you are a girl, but because your voice is like this it's it's could be very ambiguous and you don't want that ambiguity I'm like who says that i don't like it's this it's my voice but yeah we'll, yeah we'll get that commentary that already tacks on you because the experience that you were sharing adriel was a lot for me too like i had to to switch things up very quickly moving away from predominantly black town black culture into a PWI when I can probably count someone who looks like me in an entire auditorium on one hand mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. realizing that, you know, I can't, I have to present myself differently the way that you want me to be in order to get a modicum of respect and to get valued as a human being, because if I don't display what you expect from me as a black woman, then for some reason I'm devalued. And that's why the code switching is always more about not just how we speak, but what we say, how we look, like the whole, the whole enchilada, as they say. Right, right. That also just made me think, um about and i don't know if you you experienced this too or if you have or currently do but almost the reverse occurs too right where growing up i would go you know i mentioned going into my school and how people would try to like mock me and stuff the same thing happened in my neighborhood too so Why after a while like spending time in my school I'm coming home and my friends in my neighborhood are like, who mostly went to public and charter schools in the neighborhood with people that look like them. They would be like, oh, so you're trying to talk, you're trying to act white now? Oh, you're oh, an Oreo. Yeah. These were oh, things that people said to me as a yes. child, right? And so again, yes. going back to that, who the hell am I trying to figure out my identity? Um, those things impacted me. And it was like, no, I don't feel that way. And then even now into adulthood one of my good friends we talk about this where you go into spaces and you're trying to meet new people um in black spaces and sometimes there's this like oh you think you're better than us because you can talk properly kind of thing and it's like nah <laughs> not even like i'm i'm just this is this is a culmination of all the spaces that i've been in and this is just who i am right i don't think i'm above below anything um or anyone um but it's it's really discouraging and it's frustrating because it's like where do you belong? Where are you safe to just be you without someone challenging it or questioning it or calling you out and calling you things, you know, out, out of your name? It's tough. Karen, I it saw you kind of 
Yeah, that. <laughs> um, yeah, the the second the second you started talking about how it happens in the reverse, I I feel like I have experienced the the entire spectrum of all of this from you know sounding like an Oreo, like an Oreo in some spaces. Like it's it's to the point where hearing that word is slightly triggering for me being called an Oreo so much. Cause I, I went, like, I, I grew up in a mixed neighborhood in, in Houston. I went to mostly white schools. Um, my high school was a school within a school. So it was a white school within a very black school. Um, then went to PWIs, you know, for all of my college career. And so that sense of being around other black people where you're just I'm very much trying not to sound like the tragic Negro here, but like you, you get to the point where you just feel like you're not accepted because you don't sound like us. You don't have the same timber, you know, the way that you say things are slightly different and, you know, getting black checked is a thing and getting black checked often is a thing where it's like, you look like you're black, but you're whitewashed, or oh, you, you're you're too bougie. And this and being called bougie before was cute. It wasn't a thing. Mm-hmm. And so you're you're so right about the double consciousness. You're so right about having to spend all of that mental energy getting into a room, reading the room, understanding the players of the room, seeing how you fit in, keeping yourself mentally safe, and then you can actually have a conversation. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. That baggage is so exhausting. I don't think, uh, one thing that comes to mind is, I know they do it from a facetious way and also from a biracial way, but Key and Peele had a segment in one of their episodes where, um, he was called white Jeff and black Jeff, and he was dating a white woman at a restaurant. And when the, you know, wait staff was being a little rude or aggressive, he didn't know which, which Jeff to be. He didn't know if he needed to be the black Jeff because she was like, where's black Jeff to like call him out on this. And then he's like, well, and then he tried to do like the white Jeff, which was more gentle. And eventually he just, he gets it all mixed up because he just, he just wants to enjoy a meal. He doesn't want to have to to decide which mask that I have to put on and take off for me to just enjoy my freaking meal. And though it had like a really hilarious take to it, it does point to how we deal with things on a daily basis, Mm -hmm. always having to, to always think about what audience am I engaging with? How can I, and this is where is a detriment to us for exhaustion. How can I make those people feel comfortable with me? Right? Before anything else, before I can think about my own mental health and safety, my thing is I won't be able to get anything across or anything that I need unless I look the part that makes them feel comfortable with me. And then everything else has to get tacked on that. That's extremely exhausting. And when you add the different layers, right, of you get the, the reverse, you get the feeling of, because I'm code switching, because I have this dual consciousness that I have to keep flipping, I also have people in my community who don't understand that. And then we are um, forced to decide like, well, trying to say, well, I am still black. We have to, we have to measure our blackness. We have to check our blackness. Like, yeah, no, I'm black. Like, oh yeah, but you sound white. And then you go to other institutions where you have folks who have deal with respectability politics that ties onto it as well. It's just so tiring. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think there's, um, as you were talking, it, it made me think about on one hand, yes, often this code switching, Karen's coming right back. She just had a quick technical refresh. Um, but on one hand, um, you know, you're code switching often to appease other people, to fit in, to yeah. accommodate the needs. But it's also a survival tactic. I think someone commented, yes. added this in the comments um, on LinkedIn a bit ago. Um, but 
uh, Camille, thank you for sharing, but it's, it's a, a survival tactic to quote you that we cook up to try and stay safe. And I think that's spot on, right? Mm -hmm. It's, um, and even now, um, someone else had commented before we, we went live about how they're, they're wondering if, you know, this, their, their lack of code switching is impacting their ability to secure a job. And I said, yes, yeah, very possible. It's mm -hmm. very possible if you are actively choosing to say, hey, this is who the hell I am. What you see is what you get. You either want me or you don't. It could very well be. And if you, you know, uh, one good example, when black women are direct, it is often seen as it's being aggressive or, oh, just calm down. Like, you don't have to be mm -hmm. so serious, right? No, I'm just being direct. I don't have time to sugarcoat things right now. Uh, we're trying to get something done. You want to know X, Y, Z. So I'm telling you X, Y, Z. D am I putting on to do it? No, because it's exhausting and I don't understand why I need to. Um, but there's this expectation. And I think often we forget how unconscious that expectation is that we have for people, for black women, especially because that's what I'm talking about, who I'm talking about in this moment. Um, but there is this unconscious expectation. Um, a lot of this, a lot of what we're talking about happens uh, unconsciously your your subconscious brain is very very powerful and i think it's easy you know even myself over time i've said you know i don't want to code switch i'm i'm not doing that um and yet i just you know started this talk off by telling you how i went to a meeting and walked out and had this deep sigh of relief and felt my body at ease which is mm -hmm. a clear indicator for me when i've been tense when i've been stressed when i've been anxious is i have this this the shoulder tenseness I'm like lord don't let it lead to arthritis but seriously it it really i feel my body just like tense up um and so being aware of that, I'm, you know, now trying to be a little bit more mindful of those moments in the moment, in the present moment of when I might be code switching, even just slightly, right? Because I find that I generally will talk the same across the board. This is just how I talk. I go into a workshop, I go into a client meeting. This is my voice. I used to, I look back at some of my old content and I saw myself like, hello, welcome to my channel. I'm so happy to have you here. My name is Adrielle, right? Now I'm like, hey y'all. All right, anyways, let's get to it, right? <laughs> and so that has required so much self-awareness. And we talked about this ages ago, Chloe. I think you brought us some stats about how few people are self-aware. And I think it's so important to be mindful of your unconscious code switching because of how mentally taxing it is. I mean, yeah. it is, you are depleting your cognitive resources by yeah. trying to code switch. If you're spending all this, this mental energy on, you know, even the key and peel example of, you know, what should I order? Wait, okay, I have to check this person. Wait, do I use black Jeff, white Jeff? Like, I don't even know if I ordered the right thing. I probably ordered something with something I'm allergic to because I'm panicked right. over here, right? Like. <laughs> It's a lot. So I need to get the EpiPen. I did not remember ordering the crawfish, but I did. Right. You know, you know? <laughs> it's it's really sad. Um, but I do think that there are potential consequences to not code yeah. switching. I, I'm, you know, with, I'd love that this conversation has started because there was a part of me that ran across another event um, on LinkedIn where someone was sharing some of the unspoken rules about corporate spaces. And there was a lot of black women in there and the idea of co-switching did seep its way in there a little bit, but they wasn't, that wasn't the focus of the talk. So it wasn't really covered, but I think in working the spaces that I'm in, where I'm dealing with a lot of individuals who are just now entering the corporate space, moving into, you know, tech or pivoting into other roles, there's a lot of these unspoken rules that we had to learn the hard way, right? Because my parents were blue collar workers. They never went to college. I was the first one in, in my family to go. So we had to learn some of these things the hard way. And what we were taught was that if you work hard, if you put your grind in, you know, you're going to, yeah, you're going to get, you're going to get, you're going to get successful. Would you be doing that for years? And it doesn't change. And that's because there's these unspoken rules of how we navigate as black people, especially black women in these professional spaces that no one really educated us on. And part of that really is the code switching because like I said, if you're worried about, you know, how you get in this role, how you get this job, I've heard my brothers have the interview voice. 
their interview voice doesn't sound anything like my brother is because they also knew that if I'm going to get this job, if I'm talking with these folks, I need to make sure that I present what they believe is professional, meaning talking very clear, very clean, no AAVE, no accent. I'm dressed to the nines. I can't remember how many people when I used to work in the office would be like, you are just so decked out today. And I'm like, really? I was brought up, I have to dress to the nines. Uh-huh. It's great that you can walk in with jeans and a t-shirt. Let me walk in there with jeans and a t-shirt. I'm not going to get the same like freedom response. Oh, Karen, your face response. <laughs> Let it loose. <laughs> so many flashbacks. My word. Okay, well, a couple of things. A, I am also painfully chronically online, so you get over it. Um, <laughs> and one thing that I saw that really stuck with me is somebody asked the question, what is the difference between aggressive and assertive? And the answer was your race and gender. Bow on it. Well, <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> excuse me, while I go lay down for a second. I don't, okay. Um, so that, that was just kind of one thing that just absolutely hit me. And especially being a black woman and the, the intersectionality of a black woman and and the fact that not only do you not get the privilege of being just kind of fun and a woman, like you have to perform to yes. to not be like, oh my God, why are you so angry? Or, oh wow, you're you're quiet. Is there something wrong? It's like, I'm just not talking. That's, yeah. I'm just not talking. Um, but as to, again, the performative nature of code switching, and again, I, I think that that's something that I really want to hit on as a, a takeaway for anybody who's listening to this is code switching is a performance. It is an act. So it is not just a way of thinking. It's not just switching. You are performing and you are performing against the defined standards of what is considered appropriate. Now, whether it is or not, we can argue that, but mm-hmm. you're performing what what the group says is is correct. And again, as a black woman, and especially as a black woman who grew up in tech, I saw so many folks who are dressed the way that I am currently dressed now. And it wasn't until I was maybe 10 years into working in advertising and tech spaces that I felt comfortable going to work looking like this. Yeah. For years. And my, my colleagues who knew me in Seattle in my early days in Chicago would know that I would literally go to work in heels and skirts. I would still wear pantyhose. I still wore button down tops. Now imagine me walking up and down the hills of Seattle in four inch heels. Did it. Again, I think my heels are paying for them now, but I did it. But that that was because I knew looking the way that I did, I had to amp up the performance to be taken seriously. I couldn't walk into spaces being a project manager or a product manager or a manager of product management looking like this and still be taken seriously as somebody who might be a software engineer or someone who's a data analyst. They could look like who done did it and why but yet I'm the one who'd be like, hmm. hmm. What's really going on there? Interesting. Yeah. So sure. yeah, I just, again, it just, just a, a series of flashbacks from the past 15 years of my career um, of only very recently feeling comfortable in my performance and it's still a performance, mm-hmm. but being comfortable enough in my performance that I am not thinking about the corporate casual as my work. And now I'm much more interested in what's coming out of my mouth as opposed to what is on my body. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm just going to pause here for a second. For some reason, LinkedIn Live gave us the boot and YouTube has frozen. (laughs) So like somebody's getting fired. Riverside, what's going on? (laughs) This is usually my go to. Now I'm like, I don't I don't know. Um, we'll keep chatting though. If it doesn't, if it doesn't go live, I'll, I'll upload, uh, later on. Oh, Karen, I think you're, oh, Karen, can't hear you. 
that was on me. I put myself on. Me. I was like, no, <laughs> not this too. No, no, oh, that was, I, I checked you. I was like, oh god, no, that was me. That was me. Um, but I, I want to also talk about Keon Coleman, that that new that young receiver from the Bills who's just coming in from Louisiana. Mm. Um, that he, he was one about talking about like his, his Macy's jacket, and he's he's an absolutely adorable, adorable new rookie for the Bills. But he's such a perfect example of code switching yeah. because when you hear him, that boy sounds like he is from Op Opelousas, Louisiana. He sounds country. <laughs> but yet you hear him start to talk about football and mm -hmm. two things happen. One, his voice actually changes. So he sounds less country. And holy cow, that is one very smart young man. But yeah. my question is how many people would actually get to understand the fact that he is an incredibly smart young man, even outside of football, but especially when talking about football, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because he has such a strong accent and because he uses slang and because he's just kind of free flowing with his language, how many people would ascribe him the same way as somebody who came from, you know, um, Cincinnati, Ohio or whatever? Right, mm -hmm. right. So yes, I just I just want to just want to talk a little bit about him also. And I know we're talking about black women, but it's just been such a stark, like a stark example of code mm -hmm. switching mm -hmm. that I'm just like yeah, I just this one at least at least bring him up. No, yeah, I, I think know. it's like, important. Like my people, you sound like my people, and then <laughs> what, you switched it up just like that. What? Absolutely. Right? And every time I hear him, I'm like, oh, this baby's from back home. Oh, right. I, I love blink so and it's it's different. I, you know, and I think it's important to note too. Code switching is not exclusive to any particular identity, right? Um, you know, at the end of the day, if we're kind of just looking at, I, you know, I spend most of my time looking at workplace data, there's evidence that the majority of people, all people are masking or hiding some aspect of their identity at work, right? Yep. And whether or not they're code switching to do that, or they're just, you know, remaining quiet, or I don't dress a certain way, that could be considered some level of, of code switching in the workplace. Um, and someone had commented on LinkedIn, you know, about names and how they're using a, uh, you know, a nickname or a shortened version of their name because people just don't get the pronunciation correct, right? And so yeah. even that, you know, changing your name for a long time growing up, I did not like my name. And so I gave people shortened versions, nicknames, because I felt like it was out of place. And the constant mispronunciation um, was frustrating. And so I think, you know, different people experience that, you know, I, I have a friend who, who um, is Chinese American, they legally changed their name because they wanted to make sure that they had better prospects, job prospects. Um, so things like that occur so often amongst different identities. So I'm glad you brought that up as an example, right? It's not just exclusive to us, but you know, we, we, we probably are experiencing a, a significant tax on it and have been most of our lives, but it is certainly relevant to a lot of different people and a lot of identities. Yeah, it looks a lot of different ways. Um, I think in one of the last reports that I looked at, like at least 45% of men in corporate spaces are actually covering. And mm -hmm. covering is a sister of code switching. So right. whether it's to amp up your masculinity so you can be one of the guys or uh -huh. also trying to cover because if you are a member of the queer community, making sure that you're not accidentally outing yourself wanting mm -hmm. to make sure that you're maintaining your safety and sometimes that might be meaning of being a little more secretive about your home life so when people are talking about their spouses and stuff like that covering right. would be either you invent that so you can feel like you're part of the group or you just mm -hmm. don't participate in it mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. another sister of you know code switching because you're once again you're trying to appeal as safe and non-threatening in one of the group to the masses right right absolutely absolutely yeah, again it's it's just it's performance yeah. it's performance yeah. art and it's performance to try to fit in and, and i think that once people like really start to to understand and grok the fact that it's a show it's a mm -hmm. show mm -hmm. and the level of exhaustion it takes to be able to put on this show for hours upon hours upon hours every single day and what that right. does to your body and what that does to your mind and what that does to your heart. Like that's just, 
it's a lot. It's a lot. It like is. whether you're covering, code switching, like that's it's just a lot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It is a lot. Well, I know we're at our last few minutes and we've been disconnected from live for whatever reason. So I'll have to kind of go back and, and add the uh, recording. Um, but we did have a, a nice uh, group of folks that had joined us today. So I want to give That's them a it. shout out for not only joining, but engaging in the conversation. But to wrap us up, um, any just thoughts around ways that we can kind of mitigate the need for code switching or really I'm thinking more so mitigate the, the mental tax because for some of us, we, it's just what it is. Like we're gonna keep code switching to to survive, for lack mm -hmm. of better words. Um, so, any ideas or thoughts y'all have on just kind of managing that mental tax? And then after this, I want to just briefly touch on if there's any way other people can support folks who are navigating code switching. So, one thing I will level set with y'all don't mind is the work that we do is aiming towards a world where we would not have to code switch. You know, we know that we won't, we're, we're not there today. We probably won't be there tomorrow. It will take a long time, right? Mm -hmm. But the work that we do in diversity, equity, inclusion work is just that to where wouldn't it be great if Karen showed up in her freaking hoodie and jeans to go to work right. and she was valued for being Karen in hoodie and jeans doing a badass job at her work. She's not getting microaggressions of, oh, you look like you're from the street. So you're dressing kind of urban today kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, no, 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 no. We don't want any of that, right? That's the kind mm -hmm. of world that we're trying to work towards. But until then, code switching is a part of our lives. A lot of us who have one or more marginalized identities, code switching is part of our lives subconsciously or consciously. What you, I would suggest and what I talk to people that I work with as clients around that dual consciousness and trying to have some mental space is that you have to first build that self-awareness to realize, like Karen said, that it's a performance, that it's not really you. And with that will come some anger, right? Like, why can't I just be me? Mm -hmm. So you also have to rectify that too. And part of healing yourself is to remember who you are and that the world is forcing you to put on this performance, but it does not have to be who you are. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I couldn't add anything better to that. I, um, yeah, I, I think the only thing I, I would also talk about is to make sure that you make sure you have a closet to hang your clothes in. Mm. So you, you know, it's a performance, mm -hmm. but just like for any performance and you know, you have your costume, you have a place to hang up your costume when you're done right. and you have a place to know that that's not, that's not who I am. And that's not, that's not, I know I'm putting on a show. Yeah. And so I think having that safe space of being able to come out and say, okay, I'm not doing that anymore mm -hmm. is also super helpful. It makes it easier to go into it if you know you can come out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. I think y'all hit the nail on the head and or on the nose, as y'all say. I think it, 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 it all makes sense. And I think in terms of people supporting Chloe, you kind of touched on it with, you know, coaching people through that double consciousness. I think helping people dive deeper into that self-awareness is, is really key and having them really think about, you know, when are the moments when I feel like I'm code switching? What does code switching look like for me? How do I feel? Um, is it relevant to specific environments, relevant to specific people? I think those are all things that we don't necessarily, uh, most people don't necessarily slow down to think about and reflect on. And I think that can be really, really powerful um, and helping you determine like, is it necessary for me to put on this performance right now? Or can I just, can I just pull up and be me, right? And mm -hmm. I think that that can go a long way. Um, and again, while it might not help happen overnight, I think over time you'll start to notice some of those layers peel away and you feel more comfortable and more confident in just being you. And you're just like, whatever, if people take it, cool. If they don't, I'm cool with that too. So any final thoughts before we wrap out? As always, I just always grateful for this space. I love Likewise. this space. I really enjoy talking with y'all. And I hope 
that people had some takeaways from this session because I definitely did. Absolutely. Absolutely same. This has been uh, this 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 is the closet in which I can hang up my my clothes. Um, <laughs> so that's that's it's a wonderful thing to be able to be in a place where you are seen and heard and understood. Um and I just wish for everyone to be able to have that also. Definitely. Awesome. Well, as always, a pleasure having both of you. I will share both Karen and Chloe's information in the description. So please reach out to them. Um, they are like me, accepting new clients. So reach out, drop them a, a DM, email, carrier pigeon, whatever it is um, <laughs> to be in touch. Um, otherwise, I will see everyone back here for another episode of DEI and Five Live next Thursday. The series is back. So be sure to subscribe and follow for updates on what we're talking about next. Thank you all again. Thanks, Bye. Bye.